Um, so today we're joined by by Edwin. Uh, but a bit first, at Law Path, we're, we're a bit of a software and tech company as much as we are a, a legal and accounting practice. And we, we do have the awards to show for it. We're always improving and introducing new legal documents and updated software to improve the user experience on the platform. Um, but what we've built is basically the ability for Australian business owners to get professionally drafted documents that they can fully customize and they can complete within five to 15 minutes with the assistance of some very intuitive software tools, but also getting human assistance with the creation and finalization. The purpose of today is to introduce you to how that works and within the presentation, answer any questions you would likely have about creating legal documents. We'll cover a bit about LawPath, who we are and how we can directly assist. Uh, I'll introduce Edwin, you can see there, who will be in, in discussing today's topic. Um, Edwin will be covering how to access the right information for your documents, how to use the doc builder, uh, and how to meet the formal requirements of your documents, as well as going into detail around the LawPath AI tools we, we have there to assist you. Finally, we'll conclude with a Q&A session, as well as any ideas for documents, uh, document improvements. We'll really appreciate your feedback. You'll be able to submit your questions in the Q&A chat box. You'll see there's two uh, on your screen. It's a separate button from the general chat. You'll see that obviously that general chat is for general inquiries um, outside of the webinar. Uh, but if you do have questions pertaining to the topic, please ask them in the Q&A. I'm keen to get stuck into the presentation as there's a fair bit of content we have lined up for you today. But quickly, for those of you who are visiting us for the first time, uh, we at LawPath are an Australian-based online legal platform. We reside in Sydney, but we have clients across the entire country and we've assisted over half a million small and medium businesses uh, in the last 10 years, whether it's through company registrations, providing documents or affording uh, offering affordable legal and accounting and now tax aid for their business. So we're tailor-made for startups. We run on a largely subscription-based model, which has saved the ind individual business owner thousands of dollars in legal and accounting fees. Uh, but within the last decade of Australia, we're, we're proud that we've saved small businesses over $100 million in, in legal fees. If you do have some specific, specific questions about LawPath, please feel free to ask that in the general chat. Uh, but you can also pay us a visit to our website, to our LinkedIn, to our YouTube channel. We have an FAQs page. Uh, but if you'd like to speak to someone from our customer service team, uh, also feel free to type yes in the general chat box. Um, we will be offering a free legal advice with our lawyers at the end of this presentation. Uh, so please stick around if you'd like to hear some more about that. And I'll include a few links in the chat uh, shortly if you'd like a head start in seeing what that's all about. So today we'll be joined by Edwin. Edwin is an admitted lawyer and a product manager for LawPath overseeing our legal documents. Uh, so he's the best qualified to, to take us through the webinar today. So that's enough for me. I'll uh, hand things over to you, Edwin. Thank you. Thanks, Connor. Uh, and just a reminder that you can press the Q&A button at the bottom and submit your questions at any time during the presentation and I'll try to get to them all at the end. All right, so let's get straight into it. First of all, what is doc guidance and where do we find it? So in every document, you will notice that there is a questionnaire on the left and that the document itself is presented on the right and the answers that you put into the questionnaire will impact the document directly. We also have a separate product called Workflows. It gives you like a, a checklist of things that you have to do in order to achieve a goal. You can think of our questionnaire as a workflow in order to complete the document. So every step uh, adds something important to the document. So using agreements as kind of paradigm for a document, even though there are many different types of documents, generally there's four different types of information that you have to provide. There's party details, and I'll get into the appropriate parties in a second. Um, there's details about the transaction and the specifications, so what service is being provided, um, when payment is being given, and so on. Then there's legal terms, which will include things like liability limits and jurisdiction. And finally, uh, some questions will determine what kind of signature block will be presented. So you may notice that as you go through the questionnaire, the sort of document on the right slides up and down. And that's because 
um, we, we provide the questionnaire in a kind of logical flow whereas the document is kind of just more of a, a technical legal um, document. Uh, this will make more sense in a moment. So yeah, it's important to know that if you don't know how to answer a question, this is an indication that you're not ready to complete the document. Uh, I highly encourage you not to skip over questions because um, it may not be clear from the outset how important they are, or how much the document they're going to determine later on. Uh, some questions may seem to um, suggest things going wildly wrong with a certain transaction or something, which may not be a concern when things are going rosy, but if a uh, conflict ever arises, you wanna make sure that your, your agreement covers all the relevant bases. Um, and if you don't know how to answer a question, it may be that you need to do some more fact finding or that uh, may not be familiar with the law. In that case, we provide information uh, as I will show below from any sources to help you answer the question. And you can also contact us on Intercom. So how do I access information relevant to my document? Well, when you first find a document through searching for it on a platform, you can click directly onto it um, and that will bring you to the document summary page. That page highlights how documents must be signed, any post execution steps required, highlights where you can and can't edit documents. So there are some documents, for instance, like um, powers of attorney uh, and um, statutory declarations that are laid out in a way that is equivalent to the way uh, that the template is presented by the government. And if you tweak this word in it, that may make it invalid. So we make that clear in the document description. Uh, we also highlight related documents uh, that may help you structure a transaction. Um, let's say you find one document related to uh, like a letter of demand or um, starting a sale of a business and you also want to tack on a few intellectual property assignments onto that, then yeah, we will link to those in the description. And we also highlight where you might need legal advice to complete a document. So let me be clear, we do present documents um, in, in a matter that is, is fairly DIY, but there may be documents that are high risk and in some circumstances you may be required to seek legal advice to make sure that they're appropriate to your circumstances. Uh, so always pay close attention to the summary page. Um, this is what it looks like. As you can see, there's a bit of bold there and there's some information about foreign surcharges, um, which will indicate that if you are um, yeah, paying, um, if you have foreign beneficiaries and things may be a little bit more complex for you. Uh, another way that we provide information to help you fill in the fields are by providing tips and common answers. So these uh, help with three things. Firstly, to understand how the document works. Uh, so how the um, answer to the question will affect the document which may not be intuitive at first. You help you make sound commercial choices by showing you what commercial effects may flow from you selecting to have uh, an intellectual property clause or not. And finally, it will tell you about what industry best practice is for certain provisions. Uh, here, there's a bit of a numerical guide about drag along rights. We may also have uh, common answers, uh, which you can just click on and it will automatically insert that text into the field. So none of this should be taken as legal advice. You might be familiar with this disclaimer. You may see it in places of the law part of that, but what does that mean? Um, I want to make it clear that it's just as much to protect you as it is to protect ourselves. It's not just so you don't sue us when you take something too seriously. It's so that you don't take something that is intended as very general advice. Um, that will work for maybe a you know, majority of people doing a certain transaction or process and see it as being 100% appropriate to your circumstances, which may have one or two factors that um, may require you to do things differently. Uh, that's what lawyers are for. They help you navigate that maze of different legal requirements and should you require legal advice, we'll refer you to our legal advice plan or our marketplace. Um, and those are the only places you won't find those disclaimers because 
there you will be talking to a lawyer who will be analyzing your circumstances to give you advice based on that. Uh, so now on to the next section, using the document library and builder, do's and don'ts. So the first step is finding the right document um, within the document library. And unless you um, click on some of the recommendations that are given, you might just find a document through the search bar. Uh, I want to make it clear that there's no difference between an agreement and a contract, first of all. So if you're looking for one and find the other, then not to worry. They're exactly the same. Um, also, we sometimes change the names of documents for SEO purposes. So a uh, document can sometimes in practice be called three different things describing the same thing. And the best way to see if it's a document that fits your circumstances is to read the document description and summaries. Um, finally, jurisdiction is very important. We will specify when documents can only be used in certain jurisdictions or when it can't be used in certain other ones. By jurisdiction, I mean, for instance, New South Wales or Queensland. Uh, so, so there are a range of documents like powers of attorney that are determined by state legislation that can only be drafted and signed in some states. Some, some states don't allow for e-signatures or really any kind of online processing of documents that require hard copies. Um, and just to clarify, in case you're not familiar with the concept of jurisdiction, uh, jurisdiction refers to um, when the courts or institution of a, institutions of a particular state have the power to deal with a certain document, transaction, party, act. Um, and so in Australia, there are various state jurisdictions that are not necessarily designed to be overlapping. They exclude each other. And then you have the federal jurisdiction, which applies to everything, but only in some cases. Uh, so, yeah, it refers to what institutions can act on certain things, but it also refers to what laws govern certain transactions. So the laws around property, for instance, stamp duty are different in New South Wales as they are in Queensland and they are in Victoria. Sometimes you can just get away with choosing which one you want to apply to the document. Sometimes the jurisdiction will be determined by certain legal factors. Um, and yeah, yeah, want to make sure that you're using a document that falls in the right jurisdiction and that you select the right jurisdiction when the question is asked. Uh, so, here, I want to talk a little bit about um, what may go wrong in documents from a technical perspective. So you might find that there's something wrong with your document if you start deleting dynamic fields, which is to say the sort of yellow boxes where variable text, where, where the answers to your questions will be inserted into the document. Um, or also your answers to certain questions may change nothing about the document. That may signal that something is wrong. Um, and so one reason that you may answer yes or no to a question, for instance, about inserting an additional clause, and then you don't see that clause inserted, maybe because you've actually deleted a whole section of the document that had the space for that optional clause hidden in the middle. To avoid this, what we recommend is going all the way through the questionnaire on the left before making any manual changes to the document. But if you are stuck with any technical issues, please feel free to reach out to us on Intercom. So how do I ensure my document is valid? This is very important. In fact, one of the most important considerations of any document um, because it's not enough that both parties believe in it, but the courts have to believe that it works that way too, especially with some of the high risk documents like deeds. So the first step is getting your parties right. What do I mean by parties? The parties to an agreement are the ones who will be bound by the terms of the agreement to each other. This can be a little bit complicated to understand, so I want to use the uh, non-disclosure agreement as an example. Uh, so at the end of the day, who signs any document? It is individuals. But that doesn't mean that those individuals are the parties to the agreement, because those individuals may be acting as representatives for an agreement or for someone else. 
in the case of them acting as an attorney for someone else. Uh, so by the signature of the individual, it will be companies that are bound. So yeah, just so you understand the difference between a signatory and a party. Now, what do I mean by parties being bound to each other? So let's say that you have two companies that are both like large companies with a lot of employees and they sign a non-disclosure agreement with each other so that um, information relating to how they take the project is not leaked to other parties. Uh, so if either of the parties were to leak that information, then they would be liable to the other party because obligation is to them. However, um, a, an employee of an individual company does not equate to the company itself. So while an employee acting on behalf of a company may leak information and put the make the company liable for that leak, that individual is not directly obligated by the high level non-disclosure agreement. So what will happen is you'll have a non-disclosure agreement with two companies signing and then those companies will have individual non-disclosure agreements with all of their employees to make sure that they're bound. Um, so yeah, they're excluded from the original agreement, but then their obligations are wound up with that agreement through other agreements. I hope that makes sense. Um, some agreement terms are one too many. Um, this is kind of a rare instance, but it's most commonly used in terms and conditions. So um, when you go through a website, you may sign an agreement that is nothing more than an agreement to, to pay a certain amount and receive a certain product. But there is a reference somewhere in the, the flow of you paying to terms and conditions of the website. And this will be laid on a separate page. And those terms and conditions will apply by reference to all of those agreements that are made regardless of who the customer is. So um, that's one example of how they may um, yeah, work that way. So yeah, in summary, do not get confused by who the parties are and who the representatives are. I had a question the other day asking if um, the party to uh, an agreement should be a company or a director. Uh, generally, the purpose of having a company is that the director personally is not liable for the company's debts. So a director can sign the agreement, but they should not be subject to it. Um, so how do companies sign documents? The Corporations Act provides two methods, Section 127 execution and Section 126 execution. Some of our documents offer Section 127 because it's more formal and provides more evidence. Um, and as I'll explain, our documents are drafted to be compliant to the method set out in the Corporations Act. So if you look at the question on the right, once you answer these questions, it'll be clear who has to sign and what boxes they should insert its signatures into. Um, Section 127 is rarely compulsory under legislation, if at all. I guess having more people sign and having people in charge of the organization sign just gives a greater sense of security to both parties that they actually intend to bind the companies to these obligations. Um, but you can also use section 126 execution, which is easier. So it's when a company assigns an authorized representative and they sign it on their behalf. And really anyone can be that representative. Uh, sometimes it is assumed that someone is a representative, like if they are, regularly involved in negotiations and then they show up to the signing um, session uh, or they may hold an important position like company secretary but normally uh, how you'd make sure that someone is a representative is authorized as one is by the director signing a resolution appointing them as an agent um, and then the other party may request the text of that resolution in order to make sure that that person is the right person to sign and for all company um, agreements and deeds, by the way, uh, they can be e-signed both through section 126 or 127. Um, that's sort of blanket rule in the Corporations Act make it easy for companies to sign agreements. How do partnerships and trusts as separate entities sign documents? So generally, state partnership acts allow partnerships to be bound 
by the signature of any one partner, but individual partnership agreements may stipulate specific requirements. And it's the same with any kind of entity, um, i.e. companies or NGOs, NFPs, um, there will generally be documents regulating how things are administrated, how signatures are made, and it's important to always refer to those rules. Um, so partners may also by deed appoint agents to sign for the partnership um, who will act as almost as authorized representatives, as I mentioned before. Um, so trustees may make decisions for how to use trust money according to the terms of the trust. And the same goes for attorneys and the powers of attorney. So yeah, those are the individuals, although a trustee can also be a corporate trustee, who are responsible for administering a trust um, or an attorney signing on behalf of someone else. And generally companies acting as trustees when signing a document will appear as ABC Proprietary Limited as trustee for, or as or ATF um, for the Johnson Family Trust. So that's how you should insert that into documents. What about deeds? For companies, it's the same as signing agreements and they can be signed. Uh, however, individual deed signing is regulated at a state level. So you will see this notice on many agreements. Uh, Queensland and Victoria have made very liberal, very convenient laws around signing deeds, which means that individuals can sign online without needing a witness at all. But for the other states, um, deeds must be witnessed when signed by individuals for individuals. Um, so for this reason, yeah, we discourage e-signing for other states because uh, New South Wales allows for e-signing and e-witnessing. However, um, the procedure can be a little bit complicated and therefore risky. Um, and most other states do not allow for e-signatures of deeds, even though the law may change. Um, it's also important to note that um, when you sign remotely, the traditional method is what we call counterpart signing, which is a different party sign different copies of the same agreement. And then those copies are put together and considered one agreement signed by both parties or one deed signed by both parties rather. But not all agreements or deeds allow for counterpart signing. You should check that there is a clause stating that it does. Um, what about wills, powers of attorney, and statutory declarations? These have very specific requirements according to the law. So please check the guidance provided in the document summaries. And with the exception of the powers of attorneys, which we are gradually rolling out um, as laws allow us to, to put them on the website, uh, where a document is not available for certain jurisdictions, sorry, um, is available for certain jurisdictions, but not for others, it's because the legal requirements for competing documents may not be compatible with our platform. So I believe wills can only be e-signed in Victoria. So we have a separate will document for Victoria and then a more general one, which should always be hard signed. Um, where else do I need a witness? This is a question that comes up quite regularly. Contracts for the sale of land generally need to be witnessed, something to be aware of, but then again, when you're signing a contract for the sale of land, you'll generally do so through a lawyer. Um, sometimes you'll come across witnessing requirements, which may be requested by one party, or may just be in the agreement by default. There was a time when witnessing everything was really common, but most agreements don't need a witness in order to be valid. So if it turns out that it's inconvenient to have a witness, um, then you, you could just point that out to the other party and that it's not necessary, like you know, if you're just doing a standard sale of goods agreement. How do our documents evolve over time? So we update documents in accordance with legislative changes. Uh, so you can see when a document has been updated through the metadata that's presented in the document summary page. Um, but if you've started a document before it was changed, 
and you want to complete it, then you have to generate it again. Unfortunately, there's no way for us to align the changes you made to a document with the changes that we've made. So this is an example of how we let people know that um, documents have been changed. So last year, when the family and domestic violence laws changed in order to require companies to give their employees more leave, um, to buy 10, pay, 10 days of paid leave, uh, we sent out this email and we changed our documents. So it's important to keep abreast of those changes. How do we stay up to date? We subscribe to a range of new newsletters and are informed by various industry organizations. And we regularly look through notice boards where legislative and regulatory changes are announced. So basically, LawPath works with an ecosystem of different services and also different organizations. Um, I work together with our in-house lawyers. Um, they always let me know if there's any requests that customers have made or any things that they're unsure about, uh, and I will add more guidance or I will update the documents when there may be incoming legislation. We don't make changes, however, for legislation that hasn't been put in place yet, but it's just kind of being discussed in a white paper or something like that. Um, so yeah, generally we're, we're able to catch legislation through um, this process. Um, and yeah, we're always talking about how documents can be replaced, improved, or updated. Um, we add and remove documents regularly. So over the last three months, we've added uh, a range of eviction notices and notices to vacate, an equipment installation and support agreement, an equipment purchase agreement, a mental health leave policy, and a deed of access and indemnity for directors. What about accounting documents? So you may notice that we start offering more accounting services. Um, we have not yet introduced more accounting documents. Um, when we sort of expand some of our coverage of that um, and we figure out a good way to integrate. So the more numerical aspects of the platform then we may add such documents. But at, for the moment, uh, the vast majority of our documents are of a purely legal nature. So, LawPath AI, you may have noticed that we introduced this onto the platform a year ago. Just to refresh on why we introduced it in the first place, it wasn't just because of all the hype around it. It's because um, many legal questions are important, but easily answerable. So where we found that AI works best is where there's a lot of publicly available information that gives sort of provides blanket categories of information that will apply for certain circumstances. Um, the best example of this, I guess, is um, when you have a regulator like Fair Work that puts out guidance quite regularly. Uh, and so AI may, may assist with um, pointing you in the right direction uh, about the kind of resources or you know, steps, initial steps that you may have to take with some of these proceedings. Um, we also found that lawyer-client communication suffers from a jargon problem. Even I sometimes am not aware that the words that I use may not be understood in the same way by people needing legal advice. And so that's why we have the Simplify tool. Um, we found that AI can provide industry-specific insights so it can help you um, flesh out some of the requirements um, of certain service specifications to the technical industry. Uh, and in its current form, AI, our AI tools are available to all users, including freemium. So we have Simplify and Translate, and I'll run through these just so I can cover all the material. Simplify can do three things, summarize large bodies of text, define jargon in plain English, and explain the effect of legal provisions. Um, but our tips and common answers also provide plain English explanations of legal concepts. Um, we also have Translate for the most common languages. Uh, we have Review. Um, it can identify what issues the document addresses and where in a way that may be better suited to legal documents than simply pressing control F because um, it can identify in substance what sections may refer to certain kinds of obligations and it can provide insights into a document such as uh, potential issues. Um, things that may be a little bit too vague about it. Um, but it's important to note that review does not rely on external knowledge to provide insights. 
Um, if you want to know whether a document is in compliance with the legislation, this is something that you should always ask a lawyer about. In fact, we highly recommend that AI is only used alongside our existing legal guidance and where possible that you speak to lawyers about your queries without simply following AI. I think the best example, um, sorry, the best use case that we found um, for AI uh, lies in the Simplify tool in helping people um, to unpack legal jargon. However, AI Ask remains the most popular feature to date. So it asks, our Ask can answer your general legal questions. Um, and it specializes in simple queries or address on regulatory websites, as I said, but it's important to always take these things with a grain of salt. For harder queries or queries that relate to a particular set of facts, it will give only general answers and you should then seek advice from a lawyer. Finally, we have draft, um, which will draft certain text, including uh, legal clauses. The best use case for this is to customize particular agreements for certain uh, industries. So when you're already in an agreement and you want to create a clause, um, for instance, outlining how installation for certain equipment may take place within say a showroom or um, the back ends of an IT lab. Uh, this may help you flesh out some of those steps that the service provider can take, but we do not recommend drafting documents from scratch unless they are very simple things like letters and emails saying, hey, we have not heard from you for this amount of time, um, we expect a reply regarding this important service query. Just things like that. And great for AI draft, but please don't draft more important documents from scratch. Um, it's important to seek legal advice. So how are we maximizing the potential of AI? We constantly test and refine it. I will regulatory monitor the answers that it gives um, to make sure that it's doing what we want it to do accurately and efficiently. Um, we monitor the performance of different large language models to make sure that we're utilizing the best engine and we're always working on new use cases for AI. And yeah, AI works best when it complements existing services, um, namely the document library that you can access through our essentials plan. So I want to give you guys an insight into recent queries that I've had about documents, just so you know some of the pain points that people are running into in case you run into them yourselves. So I've completed this workplace policy. Now what? So you may notice that we have quite a lot of workplace policies in our website. And also we have documents like the employee handbook that contains a lot of those policies in one. Uh, the function of workplace policies is to act as a set of principles and guidelines for the obligations that a company has to meet and it devalues that it would like to uh, adhere to. Uh, a workplace policy can't implement these things in and of itself. It has to be accompanied by uh, processes within, within the company that um, make sure that everyone understands obligations and has the resources to meet them, um, processes that keep people accountable and individuals who are charged with administering those policies. Um, but this is especially true with um, some of the more important policies um, where companies may use them to avoid uh, liability for certain um, high-risk areas such as workplace health and safety, or gender discrimination in the workplace. You want to make sure that you have someone who's responsible for looking after those things who will implement these things consistently. Can I take a clause from one document and put it in another? Yes, you can. If that original document doesn't include something that you may need. So recently we had someone take a clause from a subcontractor agreement and put in a contractor agreement. We had a look at that and it was fine. Be mindful that certain clauses, um, maybe unbeknownst to you, may actually um, be suitable in one context, but not another. 
but sometimes you will have clauses that address certain things that you may need from a document and then you checked it and it doesn't contradict the other document uh it doesn't provide competing definitions of certain concepts um and yeah so this is something that you can do but we encourage you to seek um our advice uh in doing so how do i decide on governing law and jurisdiction which i gave a summary of earlier so uh to decide on it there's mainly two considerations. The first is, are there any laws that apply by default to this transaction, say by virtue of someone being within a particular territory? Um, and secondly, what laws suit me, the drafter, best? Uh, generally, that will be the law that operates in the state where you operate, because that is a law that you will understand best. Uh, and that you are most easily able to implement, um, to, to call on, should anything go wrong. Uh, finally, what if circumstances change? Will our obligations under an agreement be impacted? So this depends. Some clauses may have um, what we call force majeure or act of God clauses or frustration clauses which will say effectively that if something big happens like COVID, then the, oper the obligations of the parties may be altered. Then there will be situations where a, part a party is undergoing the hardship and may not be able to meet all their obligations, um, but the other party doesn't want to break things off. And in that situation, parties can come to a written agreement about how to amend the obligations by amending the agreement or by, for instance, changing the way that orders are submitted for certain products or services. Um, this can be done on an ongoing basis. Some agreements are quite broad about the obligations, and so parties will be able to interpret them in a particular way or other, depending on how circumstances change. Feel free to add any more questions, by the way, um, common or even specific things that you notice in documents. Now I'll hand things back to Connor. Thank you, Edwin. So we'll go to the Q&A shortly, um, but just a little bit how obviously LawPath can, can help, uh, especially in regards to today's topic. Um, but if you do have questions and they're fresh on your mind, please post them quickly in the, the Q&A chat box so we can jump into them uh, straight away. Um, if you do have any existing contracts or you're looking to get new contracts or policy documents, employment contracts, company documents or service agreements, um, I'd recommend checking out our legal advice plan. Now, we are actually offering a seven day free trial on that subscription. So we can book you in for a discovery call with one of our senior lawyers as soon as tomorrow. It's essentially an opportunity to describe your business to us in more detail, discuss any short term concerns you have but it's also an opportunity for you to hear something you may not have yet considered for your business. And maybe we wanna make you aware of any, any legal risk uh, to your business. Um, unfortunately, when you do become a business owner, there's, there's no crash course in understanding the legalities of commercial law. If you've watched today's presentation and would like to make a start on some documents, uh, this trial will allow you to do so. We can supply your business with over 500 legal documents. You'll get unlimited edits of these and most importantly, unlimited on-call contract reviews of these documents. So if there is anything you're uncertain about or you want to be really clever and ask what additional clauses you can add in there to protect your business, book a, book a contract review. If you are a bit pressed for time though, you do also have the live chat with this description to ask a lawyer a specific question about a clause you may be reviewing are, and are unsure of, or any other question that you might have about the nature of the document, um, you know, i.e. a starting question might be, am I using the right document? Uh, we do have a very fast turnaround, so we do allow you to book same day or next working day consultations, and these are done through phone or video call, um, but we're not limited to just discussing the contract. So we, we could sit here and list a, a thousand topics and questions we're asked about, uh, but some of the hot topics we discuss include business structuring, business purchase and sale, asking obviously directly what contracts you'll need for your business for clients, partners, suppliers or employees, uh, intellectual property and trademarkings are a big one. Uh, we discuss with clients, debt recovery, 
ESOP and startup law and commercial property law. You may have a, want to look at our most comprehensive package. It's the legal and accounting advice. You can get unlimited consultations of our award-winning chartered accountants. Um, and even if you have already an accountant, um, if we look, if we are more convenient and more affordable, uh, you may want to consider switching over. So all of our clients want to know how they can save a dollar as a, a dollar spent. Uh, sorry, a dollar saved is better than a dollar spent. Uh, and some of the hot topics our users book in for include tax minimization strategies, tax concessions they're eligible for, what they can claim as tax deductibles, uh, business structuring advice or, or restructuring. Uh, we also cover GST, PAGE, crypto tax now and capital gains. Uh, and if you have questions around reporting payroll or bookkeeping, uh, we can answer for those, those for you as well as a whole host of other tax and accounting related questions. There is also the add-on option to get your tax needs met. So the tax compliance includes BAS lodgements, tax lodgements, financial statements, uh, and we do offer a special fiscal year consultation to do a deeper dive and analysis of your business spending and revenue. So for all our attendees, if you would like to opt in for the seven-day free trial on our legal advice plan, uh, please type in yes in the chat. Obviously, senior lawyers typically bill uh, $600 for an hour of their expertise. You can get a week for free, uh, and you'll also have immediate access to our templates. You can book their discovery call and speak to one of our team uh, tomorrow. Uh, but thanks for listening to that. We'll go.